welcome to the first year physics laboratory. The first exercise you'll be doing is called introductory experimentation. In this experiment, you'll be learning how to estimate errors and uncertainties, to analyse data with uncertainties, and to obtain estimates of errors from graphs. During the laboratory exercise, you'll learn how to log into our computers and then you'll be answering three questions which will require you to analyse data with errors. Before you come to the laboratory, it's important that you log into Blackboard and attempt the pre-work questions there. If you have any difficulty logging into Blackboard or answering these questions, you can come to the first year physics office and get some assistance. Before you come to the laboratory, you also need to read over a couple of chapters in your laboratory manual. The chapters you need to read are called Errors and Error Estimation and Using the Computers. Any measurement you take is going to have an error associated with it. In the first year lab, we expect you to estimate this error and take it into account. There's two main types of errors. We've got systematic errors and random errors. Systematic errors are errors with a non-zero mean. Some examples of systematic errors include calibration errors, zero errors, and possibly errors in technique. An example of a zero error is on this scale here. It's set to read minus 5.6 grams now. So if I put place a weight on it, the reading for this weight is going to be off by 5.6 grams. No matter how many weights I put on it, the reading will always have an uncertainty of 5.6 grams. The next type of error are random errors. These are errors with a zero mean. This means that the value you record is as likely to be above the actual value as below it. Examples of random errors include limitations due to the scale on the equipment. So for example, with the scales we saw below, before, they would only read to 0.1 grams, which means that they're only accurate to half of that last increment, so 0.05 grams. Another cause of random errors is random fluctuations. So for example, if you were measuring background radiation, that you can never get an exact reading for that. You need to take lots of readings and take the average. During this experiment, you'll be considering random errors. You won't consider systematic errors until the standing waves on the wire experiment later in session. During the lab and the pre-work, you'll be required to calculate the value and the uncertainty in the value given a range of data. An example of how to do this is imagine you have the data 5.2, 4.9, 4.8 and 5.1. To calculate the value, you just need to calculate the average. So to do that, you add them up and divide by the number of data points, so in this case 4 and that gives us the average of 5.0. Note how our average value has two significant figures because each of our values is measured to two significant figures. The average and the data values all need to have the same number of significant figures. To calculate the error, we use the range divided by the two. The range is simply the highest value minus the lowest value, and then we divide that by two. So in our case, we do 5.2, that's the highest, minus 4.8, which is the lowest, and divide by 2. When we do that, we get 0.2. The error should have the same number of decimal places as the average. It wouldn't make sense to give the error to more decimal places than that, because then we're claiming that we know the error more accurately than we know the value, which would be nonsense. So when we write the value, we write value equals 5.0 plus or minus 0.2. When analysing errors, you'll first need to work out which type of error it is. There's two types of random errors. We have independent and dependent random errors. Independent random errors are errors that come from different sources. 
So for example, if we were trying to measure the force on something, force is given by mass times acceleration. We can measure the mass with scales and the acceleration of the body with a piece of equipment called an accelerometer. These are two different measurements which are made using two different pieces of equipment, so these errors are independent of each other. The other type of error is dependent errors. These errors have the same source. So an example of where we might have a dependent error is if we were measuring the mass of ice. We might measure the mass of a beaker first and then measure the mass of the ice in the beaker. Because both these measurements are taken using scales, this is the same source of error, and so these errors will be classed as dependent errors. Okay, we'll begin with looking at how to analyse dependent errors. If you need to add or subtract the values to get your result, then you will need to add the absolute errors. For example, if we were trying to work out the mass of ice, and we had weighed the mass of the beaker, and also the mass of the ice in the beaker, then what we'd need to do is write the mass of the beaker is 95.20 plus or minus 0.05. This is an absolute error because it has the same units as the value. The mass of the ice plus beaker is 101.5 plus or minus 0.05. This is also an absolute error. So to work out the mass of the ice, we subtract the mass of the beaker from the mass of the beaker plus the ice to get our value, which is 6.30. With the absolute errors, we need to add them. So that's 0.05 plus 0.05, which gives us 0.10. So the answer for the mass of the ice is 6.30 plus or minus 0.10. These both have the same number of decimal places. If we were to get our value, we needed to multiply or divide, and we had dependent errors. So for example, if we had to multiply two masses together, what we would need to do is start by working out the percentage error. The percentage error is the error in the value. So for the mass of the beaker, the error in the value is 0.05, and divide that by the value. So for the mass of the beaker, we divide it by 95. To work out the percentage error in our answer then, we would have to add all these percentage errors. This is explained in your laboratory manual. Now we will look at how to deal with independent errors. That's errors that come from a different source. If we have to add or subtract two numbers to get our value, so for example, we wanted to find z, which was given by x plus y, then the error in z is simply the absolute value in x squared plus the absolute value in y squared, and we take the square root of all of that. If we need to multiply or divide two numbers to get our value, so for example, f equals ma, we're trying to measure force from a reading of the mass and the acceleration, what we need to do in that case is add the square of the percentage errors and take the square root of that. So for example, this is the percentage error in f, the absolute error in f divided by the value of f is equal to the percentage error in m squared plus the percentage error in a squared and then we take the square root. So okay, for example, if we needed to work out the force and we measured that the mass of an object was 10 plus or minus 1 kilo, then to work out the error in the force, we need to start by working out the percentage error in the mass. To do this, we do 1 divided by 10, which gives us 0.1 or 10%. We then need to work out the percentage error in the acceleration. If our reading for acceleration was 3.0 plus or minus 0.3 meters per second per second, then the error, the percentage error in this is 0.3 divided by 3, which is 0.1 as well, or 10%. We can then work out the percentage error in the force. The percentage error in the force is given by the percentage error in the mass squared, 0.1 squared, plus the percentage error in the acceleration, which is also 0.1 squared, added together and take the square root. 
When we do that, we get 0.14. So the percentage error in our force is 14%. Our force in this case is just given by the mass times the acceleration, which is 30 newtons, and our error is 14% of that. 14% of 30 is 4. So we can write our value for the force as 30 plus or minus 4 newtons. Note that they both have the same number of decimal places, they have no decimal places. So both our error and our value have no decimal places. You've now covered enough material to answer the preliminary problems on Blackboard. Remember to come to the first year office if you need any help with this.